everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today to celebrate the fabulous, what will be a fabulous reading for a launch of a wonderful book by Catherine Owen. This would be Aether. Um, my name is Noelle Allen, and I am the publisher of Woolsack and Wynn uh, here in Hamilton. And I am delighted to be here talking to you all. Uh, though you won't hear much from me because really, you really want to hear from Catherine about this wonderful book. I just want to thank you for coming out on what has become a sunny night and to thank also our funders for making this possible without bodies such as the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Department of Canadian Heritage, we could not bring out these wonderful collections. Now, uh, before we start, um, one of the things I'd like to do is even though this is, is online, we are lucky to be rooted in the city of Hamilton and I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, so the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of this covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anish Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners, and caretakers. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to note for those who might find it useful, we have enabled captioning for this event, and we've made the text of the poems being read tonight available as a PDF on our website as well. They're free for anybody to download. Brianna, who is our marketing coordinator, will be posting links to these excerpts in the chat for you as they come up. Now, we have a wonderful evening of readings ahead of us, and our fabulous senior editor, Paul Vermeersch, is going to guide us through it. And I'm, while many of you may know Paul, I'd like to take a moment here to introduce him to those of you who might not. Paul Vermeersch is a poet, multimedia artist, creative writing professor, and literary editor. He is the author of several poetry collections, including The Reinvention of the Human Hand, a finalist for the 2011 Trillium Book Award, and most recently, Shared Universe, New and Selected Poems, 1995 to 2020. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Guelph, for which he received the Governor General's Gold Medal. He teaches in the Honors Bachelor of Creative Writing and Publishing program at Sheridan College and is the founding editor of the Ampersand Review of Writing and Publishing, a literary journal published by Sheridan's Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And of course, he's senior editor of Buck Rider Books, Woolsack and Wynn's Fiction and Poetry uh, imprint, which is where this book is placed. And so Paul, I'm just gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Noel. It's my pleasure to introduce the uh, uh, writers who are gonna be reading tonight. And uh, here to join Catherine Graham uh, uh, for this launch is her great friend in poetry, Kathleen McCracken, who is joining us all the way from Ireland. So we're very uh, pleased that, um, well, it's about midnight there that she could join us. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kathleen to you now. Uh, and although you probably, uh, already know much of this. Um, I think it bears repeating in the moment. Kathleen McCracken is the author of eight collections of poetry, including Blue Light, Bay and College, published by Penumbra Press in 1991, which was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for Poetry, and a bilingual English and Portuguese edition entitled Self-Portrait with Mirror New and Selected Poems, published by Editora Ex Machina in 2014. She is the recipient of the University of Toronto, Toronto Review's Editor's Choice Award for Poetry, the Anne Schumagalski Editor's Prize, the Glebe House Harmony Community Trust Poetry Award, and the 2017 Poetry Ireland Tyrone Guthrie Residency Bursary. She was a finalist for the Montreal International Prize for Poetry, the Walrus Poetry Prize, and the 2020 CBC Poetry Prize. In 2019, she won the Seamus Haney Award for New Writing. Kathleen is currently lecturer in creative writing and contemporary literature at Ulster University in Northern Ireland. And I'm told that uh, Kathleen will be reading two poems tonight, one by Catherine Graham and one that she has written. 
So I'll turn things over to Kathleen right now and let her say a few words about the poems she'll be sharing with us this evening. Okay, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Noel, for the introductions, and Catherine, particularly, thank you for inviting me to share in this launch of your splendid new collection, Ether, an out-of-body lyric. It, it really is an honor to be here. I'm so pleased to see this work um, in print for you. I've been reading it, and just to say, I've, I think it's every bit as accomplished and indelible as your previous collections. It's, it's been a real pleasure to read through it over the past couple of weeks. I found in it a deeply moving account of coming to terms with personal loss and an account of soul making alongside a really intelligent and acute um, probing of the healing powers of the creative process. So for any of you that haven't got hold of it yet do because it really is an out outstanding work. Um, my connection with Catherine goes back, we had to think about this, about four years. I think we met in 2017 here in Belfast. Um, Catherine was doing a reading there with another wonderful Canadian poet, Jeanette Lyons. Jeanette, I hope, is with us um, here tonight. And that was my first encounter with Catherine and her work. And I was you know, really struck by it. Um, and we began a correspondence email correspondence to begin with, in which we talked about all sorts of things, but mostly shared poetry, shared feedback on one another's work and people we were reading at the time. Um, we also discovered that, or I also discovered that Catherine had lived here in Northern Ireland for some time previously, and it remains a bit of a mystery to both of us why we didn't cross paths, but we didn't. And um, when we had that first encounter, it's kind of grown into a friendship and a poetic alliance um, since that. We've done several readings together here in Ireland at Poetry Ireland and the Crescent Arts Centre and also in Toronto. So it's been lovely and productive and inspiring to, to know Catherine and to get to know her work. Um, when I first heard her read that night in the Linen Hall, I went out and got a hold of all of her, her books and um, discovered a lot of shared shared points of contact. I mean, we were both writing about our home places in southwestern Ontario. Um, for Catherine, Halliburton, Hamilton areas, for me, Gray County. And we were both endeavoring to, um, I suppose, plow the ground or figure out ways of talking about gone parents um, and how those gone parents could be guides and guardians. And I found a lot of this in her work and it was work that I was struggling to, uh, or topics that I was struggling to articulate as well in my work. So the upshot was that I, I wrote a, a little poem for her, which I will share with you in a moment. Um, but first I'd like to read one poem from her collection, The Sowery Forest, which if I'm remembering correctly, she did read that night here in Belfast. It's called My Father Was a Bird. Freewheeling dove, sparrow, starling, never of the flock, his quills beneath his skin, his wing tattoo prepared him, stamped predestination. He practiced flight with each flex of his bicep to be skyborn for six seconds, his flight through the flying car. Um, and my poem, I guess, came out of reading Catherine's work generally, but particularly out of that link between the lost father and Catherine's totem animal, um, the deer. It's called Candle Trees, and it looks back to her references, um, the Latin word candelabrum, which means candle trees. So candle trees for Catherine Graham. I read her poems late at night, rarely at noon. Though I looked for a brother, she talks like a sister, sharing secrets under the summer's tarpaulin or the skin formed over a lake in winter. Once upon a time, we saw the same doe shine at the edge of a forest. Neither of us was permitted to enter. She told me how velvet hot its antlers would burn should I reach out and touch the way a father's or a mother's hands 
might proffer a pair of horn-tipped candelabra, candle trees, their ten points a humming constellation guiding us back to the highway. So thank you again, Catherine, for having me here with you tonight. It's a pleasure and over to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was, that was quite wonderful. Uh, before we move on to our featured author and guest of honor tonight, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on the working relationship I've had with Catherine Graham, with whom I first started working almost 20 years ago. With the exception of The Watch, a beautifully produced chapbook published in Ireland in 1998, I have worked with Catherine Graham in all of her published trade collections of poetry, beginning with Poopa in 2003, followed by The Red Element in 2008, Winter Kill in 2010, her red hair rises with the wings of insects in 2013, then most recently The Celery Forest in 2017, and now Ether, an out-of-body lyric, the book we are launching tonight. It has been my honor and privilege to be a witness to the creation of all of these books and to the evolution of Catherine Graham's remarkable lyric voice, a voice that has frequently and rightly been praised by critics. Of Pupa, the Toronto Star said, this impressive collection should put her on the can-lit map. Of the red element, poet Molly Peacock said, Graham proves herself as one of Canada's premier young poets. Of Winterkill, novelist Jessica Westhead wrote in the New Quarterly, Catherine tells such incredibly layered stories with so few words that I'm constantly blinking in amazement. Of her red hair rises with the wings of insects, the judges of the Raymond Souster Award said, her muscular images and sensual language are wrought in lines that are as evocative as those of her mentors, Seamus Haney, Paul Durkin, and Paul Muldoon. Of the celery forest, the celebrated Irish poet Michael Longley said, an impressive new collection, both powerful and beautiful, a work of great fortitude and invention, full of jewel-like moments and dark gnomic utterance. It faces into the dark and finds a way through. And now the Toronto Star calls ether an intricate reverie in poetry and prose, which floats back and forth in time between memories, dreams, and reflections, and calls Catherine an accomplished lyric poet. And it's true, all of it. So what is ether? It is many things. It is an anesthetic compound that induces a deep, unbreakable slumber, and as such, it is the stuff of dreams. In its mythic sense, it is the substance of which the sky is made, and subsequently, it was believed by 19th century physicists who found natural vacuums too unthinkable to exist, to be the substance that filled the cosmos by which light could travel through the universe. It is, in its alchemical sense, after fire, air, earth, and water, one of the classical elements. Because in this schema, it is the fifth element, it is also called quintessence, a term that present day physicists in a nod to its classical roots apply to the phenomenon of dark energy and from which we take the word quintessential, a word which means representing the most perfect or typical example of something. And that is how I would describe Catherine Graham's poetry, elemental, celestial, dreamlike and mythic cosmic even, a medium equally suited to the movement of light and to the presence of a dark energy, and I think appropriately, quintessential. The themes and images that have over the last two decades become the hallmarks of Catherine's literary universe are here. Grief and the specter of death, the loss of her parents, the hauntological intrusion of the past upon the present, and Catherine's work often embodied by the image of the quarry near her childhood home, both figuratively and literally a place of submerged memory. And more recently, the personal discovery of and crossing through the surreal realm of cancer. This is Ether, the newest installment of what is emerging to be Catherine Graham's lifelong project, the celebration of life in the shadow of death, the act of holding one's breath submerged in those memories long enough to swim to the surface and breathe. And now here to launch her latest book, Please welcome, and feel free to unmute me, Catherine Graham. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, 
thank you so much. I'm going to say some thank yous before I do share some of Ether. Um, and I'm going to start with Toronto Lit Up for supporting this launch. Uh, I want to thank the Festival of Authors, the Toronto Arts Council, and also, of course, Woolsack and Wynn. Um, Kathleen, I want to thank you for that beautiful uh, guest appearance. I'm so honored that my work uh, inspired you to write that beautiful poem. And I'm so glad that we connected um, in such a strong way and we're making up for lost time. So it's all good. And thank you for being here and staying up late. <laughs> and um, yes, I'd also like to thank all of you out there. I can't see you, but I really can truly feel your energy. And it means the world to me that you have taken this time to help me launch this book, Ether into the Ether. So thank you. I also wanna thank the amazing team at Wolfsack and Wynn, Noel Allen, Ashley Hisson, Jen Rawlinson, Brianna Wodebeck, and of course, my long-term editor, Paul Vermeersch. Paul, thank you so much for your mind, your heart, your eyes, your ears, and most of all, your support and belief in my work. I'm a better writer and poet because of it. And I was going to say, well, the proof of the long-term are all of these books, <laughs> but Paul already took care of that. So yes, there is proof right there, including now this book. So thank you so much, Paul. There are many people to thank, friends and family. Um, a special shout out to Princess Margaret Hospital. Um, but I'm going to move on to uh, one particular person who is really the greatest gift of my life. And the book is dedicated to John Coates. And I can't help but think of the poem by Raymond Carver, Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life even so? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. So thank you. I think that's everybody. <laughs> I'll just look at my notes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna read from Ether in a moment, but I just wanted to say I had no plans to become a writer. The concept was foreign to me. And it was really grief that opened that door. My mother died during my first year when I was a student at McMaster. My father died my last year. And as I say, poetry found me and I found poetry and it's been the core of my life ever since. It did take me to Northern Ireland and I did an MA in creative writing there. And I remember thinking, well, I'll write one poem about my mother, one poem about my father, and then what? Well, I'm still writing about them. And for those of you who've lost someone, you know, the relationship doesn't end, it's transformed, it continues, and it can be quite powerful. And I'm grateful for that and how poetry has been sort of the outlet for that creativity and um, including this book tonight. But it was really, um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, it was the exact age that my mother was when she died of the disease. So it actually brought us closer together. And I remember after my first operation, I felt her in the strongest visceral way I had ever experienced her. It was almost worth it to go through the journey for that moment. And it really was the catalyst for this book, but it took a bit. I was actually um, at the Drake Hotel when we used to be able to have meetings <laughs> in real person with people. And it was after I teach at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. And it was after one of the instructor events and I was there with Ken Murray. And when I told him about this, he said, you need to write about this. So thank you, Ken, for pushing me in the direction. And Beth Kaplan was there as well, too. So thank you for the supportive community that's out there. Thank you for believing in words. Thank you for reading and for writing. So on to Ether. It's not the hare's scream that haunts. It's the silence that follows. I am told to breathe and it isn't work. I'm out before I can shape the air into words. They are slicing the skin at my breast, faceless, blue-dressed figures hovering. I open my eyes. Princess Margaret's white ceiling shines down. Tears, primal deep, waiting to be released, accompany a renewed purity. My mother is a keeper of secrets. Her hair red all her life, even after it grew back in. They had to tell me I was 11. We had recently moved to the quarry. It's cancer, isn't it, I said, 
holding my school, school books tight to my chest. They weren't surprised that I knew, though the reality of my knowing became apparent only after I'd said those words. Mom turned to me. I'm sorry this had to happen to you. The fortune seeing inside dreams beams yellow riddles. Questions scut exclamation points. I can't be more than whom. The cedar tree outside the window is green, but the back leaves are rusting. They hold on, they don't fall. I need more animus, raw male energy, to act without doubt, without overthinking, how draining doubt is, to be in the pool of how others perceive you, to melt into a wicked witch puddle and wait for the sun to appear from behind dark clouds, draw you into air. I told my friend I feel like a floating head, and yet my head remains to think and overthink. Damn it, why can't I be the floating headless? I once loved a boy who said he didn't love books. Why read when you can live life instead? He liked to shoot duck and deer and listen to Willie Nelson. Now I painted his neck red. And yet he was also clean cut and caring. He only hunted in season and ate what he killed. Antler deer heads hung on his parents' walls. This was normal in their house, as normal and frequent as windows in ours. The deer eyes held a frozen expression, but not one of pain. Fake eyes forever in stare. They were heads, but they weren't floating. An only child, aren't you lonely? They look at you with pity, the black circles of their pupils expanding towards outer space. Lonely doesn't come from being alone. Lonely is the loss of self with others. I once lived with a man who gave me that wisdom. It was his everlasting gift. You'll never get published without me. You're a bitter, barren woman. He makes me into a noun. I can't move. Labeling a woman bitter is like calling them crazy. It's just another way to dismiss their feelings and whatever has happened to them as all in her head. No one wants the reputation of being a bitter woman. So this manipulates women into keeping silent and the perpetrator remains protected and their behavior remains unchallenged. Sophie King, how the concept of forgiveness is used to gaslight women. I resonate with these words. I never wanted children, he just assumed that I did. He couldn't see me at all. Though in the beginning I thought he could, he had the eyes of a deer on a hunter's wall, looking without seeing, seeing without feeling, that deer turned wolf. I wipe your absence with clean stained hands. We live in vigilance after watching our mothers die. Those twin sexual organs that hold milk for babies and desire for others carry a terror for us. We succumb to having them flattened like pancakes on mammogram plates. We suck in our breath through winces of pain and ignore the metallic buzzing of the taking image. Our breasts don't belong to us then, squeezed and handled with efficient gloved hands, molded like Play-Doh. At night, we dream they're hacked off. We need to do a biopsy. Oliver Sacks gave me a power cord. He handed over to me like a gift and said, make electric with it. This happened after he died. Earlier that day, I heard his voice on the radio. A previously taped interview aired as an acknowledgement of his death. Did he know about my floating head? Maybe that's why he gifted me the power cord to connect me to him like an umbilical cord and to think Oliver Sacks gave it to me, some anonymous Canadian poet still writing poems about her dead parents. If I jump into pain, will it hurt me? Parents die in the world, but they never die in their children. And yet a distance remains edged with abstraction. This changed under the spell of anesthesia. Feathers forever falling from birds, feathers become my talismans during my months of cancer treatment. City streets, sidewalks, parking lots, feathers from sparrows, seagulls, pigeons. 
Pigeons wedged in a flower-rimmed scrum pecking madly for bread. The machine gun stutter of the cardinal. And I remember these words from my first creative writing teacher. Your subject matter chooses you. Death chose me. Ghosts have no substance, require no sustenance, walk through water, stone. And now birds, these creatures with wings that fascinated my mother become a feathered bridge. Be as small as a hole for birds to fly through. One night while waiting for a date for my second surgery, waiting is harder than knowing. The surgeon didn't get clean margins. He needed to go back in. I fall asleep. I'm alone in the house looking out at the quarry when a flock of mallards fly by. One flaps through the half open window. She beats her wings in the cage of trapped space, knocks against the family room walls. I reach for her panic. Cupping her breast, I guide her out. Wide awake, I feel her pillow sock imprint on my palms, the ghostness of her breast feathers, a bird in house. I enter my own cage of panic. Isn't that an omen? But I guided her out. I saved her. I recall the figure ground illusion, faces, vase. When you see two faces, you can't see the vase. The mind only perceives one image at a time. Bird in house, bird out of house, omen, gift. Water falls to where the heart aches. A ladder slowly lifts and the birds, the birds hurl themselves up. In my journal, I write this sentence. I'm walking down the street when a feather floats into my line of vision. An hour later, I'm walking down the street to see my therapist when a feather floats in front of me, wind lingering before it touches ground. My words have come to life. What does it mean? My therapist tells me a story about Young. He was working with a patient who dreamt about a scarab beetle. The patient, having told Young about it, was resisting deeper meaning when a brittle tapping came from the window. A beetle trying to fly through glass. A feather floats into my line of vision. We see the connection as a sign of affirmation. You are called into a crowd of feathers. I often work with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis with their poems. They read their draft aloud and I sit with their work, think it through with all the knowledge and experience and intuition from my years of writing and studying the craft. And when ready, I share my thoughts and insights. Try cutting the first line. The last line isn't needed, see? Can you be more precise with this image? The poetic logic is here except for the last stanza. A student I work with tells me she's been diagnosed with breast cancer so many of us on this journey. She gives me a copy of her latest poem. I follow along as she reads aloud. A bird flies through an open window. It flaps from wall to wall, searching for the way out. I reach to cup its panic, warm and plump and thickly feathered. I guide it to the open window. It flies away, becoming sky. She sees the expression on my face. You could feel those breast feathers on your hand. She nods. How did you know? Before my coming out of ether, I talked to my mother. She never answered, but I talked anyway. How can you be gone more years than my being here? How can that be when there hasn't been a day in which you haven't entered my mind as insight, revelation, or memory, hovering like a patch of scuttering clouds? To hear your voice, to smell your scent, but without the base coat of your skin to mix with Chanel number no. five, no scent of you. Mom, we are having a conversation in our silences. Silence is a kind of flight. She came as light, darkness, a backdrop for her glow. She moved with the slow speed of her walker before wheels were added to them 
the constant up and down rhythm. He could hear the scraping. He was in bed, the door wide open, and saw the approaching light. They say sightings happen during the span of three days after death. The soul, if you believe in the soul as a form of energy, is released from the body like the remaining warmth after a television switched off, the nest inside the heat. Rest your hand there and you'll feel it, the aftermath of a lie before it goes cold. Russ, is that you? The urge to run to her, he bolted up, but his legs wouldn't move. Locked by invisible chains, he couldn't battle their grip and weight. Russ, the light hovered. I was jealous of his sighting. Now I don't have to be. I shift my legs on the stretcher. You're here, but I can't see you. This is better than light, honey. You know that. If I'd known that cancer would bring me to you, then this wouldn't be a gift, would it? It would be an expectation. You couldn't know. Don't leave me. You won't, will you? I can never leave you. I am your scars. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me here. Um, I hope one day to be able to do this and clink a glass with you <laughs> and perhaps sign the book. <laughs> and thanks again to the Woolsack and Wynn team. I'm really, truly honored by all the beautiful words that were said. And it means so much to me to see your names and flashing comments in the chat, but I had to sort of concentrate on this. So maybe I can look at that later. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, that was stunning and absolutely brilliant reading. And I think we're pretty much finished for the evening. Um, I actually don't know how anything could follow up after that reading. Um, so I'm going to hope that you enjoyed this incredible celebration. I know that I did. Um, if you haven't already purchased a copy of Ether, I encourage everyone to support their local bookstores in doing so. We're lucky in Hamilton to have many great independent bookstores, but I hope most of you have one that you frequent as well. Um, the book is also available directly from the press or through Chapters Indigo and Amazon if you don't have a local bookstore near you. Thanks so much to Catherine and Kathleen for, uh, for those moving readings and to Paul for being the fabulous master of ceremonies that he always is. And thanks to all of the staff at the press who for their work on this book. Um, and I'd like to thank Jason, who has been managing our technology tonight, and Brianna Woderbeck, who has been helping with the chat. Um, again, thank you to Toronto Lit Up, all of our funders. Thank you for remembering Toronto Lit Up for me, Catherine. Um, and I think we can say good evening. Thank you all so very much for attending in this wonderful, sunny April night. Goodbye.